It really is about creating conversations. Arrow.net. A-R-R-O-E.net. All right, let's do it. Let's pod crash. Episode number 147 is with Will Fulton from the podcast Thrillist Explorers. Hey, Arrow. What's going on? How are you? Fantastic. I'll tell you what. You, your, your podcast is everything that I try to promote to the different universities that bring me in to talk about podcasting and broadcasting and stuff like that. That, that you, you take people places. And isn't that really what all of this is about? Oh my God, it so is. Like I, I, that's, you gotta hit the nail on the head and that's what's really different about this season. We're actually taking people to these cities. We're on the road and we're on the streets. So that is definitely what we try to cultivate over here. Well, I'll tell you what, I sure love the way that the, the very second that you, you start the podcast with, with Oklahoma City, you, you, you challenge us as, as listeners, to listen to the sound. What do you hear? And, and, you know, and, and when is the last time that we heard somebody through those speakers give us the opportunity to participate with something like that by listening? I, I love I love that you call that out. That's that's great. That's very cool. I mean, like it is. I, we try to be people engaged. My background as a writer, and I would sometimes use those tricks. You know, yeah, this kind of like, uh, you know, like put a question out there and try to challenge people's preconceived notions. So that's always super important to me, especially with a place like Oklahoma City, where I think it's just severely underrated as a travel destination and as a city in general. Well, I mean, I, I didn't know they were such open open people there. I, I mean, I just did not know. And the festival and stuff like that they put on, this is the kind of stuff that everybody around this country needs to know. I agree. and it, it honestly blew my mind too, Errol. When I went there, I, I remember someone kind of gave us a tip, a writer that was featured on the show, Matt Kerouac, and um, he was talking about how progressive it is and you know all this stuff about 39th street and the district and i had no idea and even when i went there it just it just blew my mind it really did because it's in the middle of nowhere oklahoma city you get there red state conservative state and it's just this (laughs) oasis for queer folks so amazing and and it just you know because you know you you think of san francisco you think of new york you think of the openness in 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 all these other cities but oklahoma city to me was that place that had koma when i was a kid and it used to broadcast up into montana i i and i always wanted to go there and now that you know i mean it just shows that look we we are an open forum of people yes and you know what and even beyond um the lgbtq stuff the restaurants there, the yes. bars there, the neighborhoods, the shops, just everything, even just aesthetically. The city is beautiful. Um, it is just such like a great place. It has a great quality of life. You know, I think I said this, but I'm coming from New York. And it was just like a, literally a breath <laughs> of fresh air for me. You got the opportunity to sit down and talk with 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 Ken Burns and, and Lynn, Lynn Novick. I mean, dude, to have that opportunity yeah. to tap into their imagination and in reality to listeners, they need to understand that they themselves are on a journey and, and, and you got to be a part of that. Yeah, that was an interesting one. You know, I've always uh, loved what Ken Burns does. I mean, I, I grew up watching his baseball documentary, which is so amazing. I still ter- turn it on from time to time. Um, what was interesting about that is um, they were also focused on someone I love. Um, their journey was uh, discovering Hemingway, Ernest yes. Hemingway's life, who notorious world traveler himself. So it was kind of this confluence of interest for me. You know, not only are we talking to uh, Ken and Lynn, who are my own personal heroes, but we're talking about a personal hero of theirs and of mine, Ernest Hemingway. So it's just all of this great stuff. I mean, that was one I was actually kind of nervous for, Arrow. I'm not going to lie, talking to Ken Burns. But you know what? It, it opened up my writing imagination in the way that I'm going, wait a second. You know, the, the, that Hemingway, yes, he, you know, he, he wrote in all these places, but you, you to openly talk about it, which creates the conversation, which, which allows the imagination to be ignited by things. I mean, do you see the process? It's like the seed that becomes the tree, which becomes the paper. That's what you're bringing to this podcast. Yeah, and I, I do think, you know, just, just to reiterate that, I think it's really, you know, I started as a writer. I did not start as, um, you know, a, a radio host like, like yourself. I started um, writing, writing articles, making narratives. And I think that storytelling aspect is one thing that sets our show apart from other travel shows. You know, we're not just going to Oklahoma City, for example, and being like, here's 10 things to do. We're telling a story of a subculture in that city and then trying to, uh, challenge people's expectations a little bit. So, um, yeah, that that really is what we're trying to do here. You're so right about that, about writers versus people who are on the radio who are trying to podcast, because it took me a long time to go through the evolution of becoming that storyteller. And yet when you do the, the, the history on podcasting, it didn't start from radio people and comedians. It was writers that started podcasting. They started the journey. And, and you're just right there, right along with them. 
most definitely it is, you know, and, and you look at different publications and, and, and brands from the New York Times to a place like Thrillist and they're all putting their writers on podcasts because it is such a great medium to um, expand and grow the stories that we tell every day. I mean, it, it's one thing to write a story and quote someone, and it's just an entirely different thing to actually hear their voice and hear the passion and hear those things that are sometimes uh, ineffable in writing, right? And you actually get to hear them. And that's, that's really the beauty, in my mind, of podcasts. Well, I love the way that, that you, you go into different uh, regions and stuff like that, because I'm sure there's people up in Seattle or even Butte, Montana, that have no idea what a Waffle House is. But you did a podcast on Waffle Houses. I'm here in Carolina, man. This, I know exactly what a Waffle House is and how thin that, that, that T-bone <laughs> steak is when you go in there at 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, so I, you know, I grew up uh, in, in the Northeast. Uh, we we traveled a lot down south, and it was such a tradition for us to stop at a Waffle House, my family, every time. And um, I kind of grew up loving it. And <laughs> as I got older, I kind of realized the reputation it might have for a late night hangout. Like sometimes it gets pretty wild there. So yeah, as soon as we started doing a travel show, that was one episode where I was like we have to dedicate an episode to Waffle House, you know, telling the stories, talking about its history and all of the quirky, weird, uh, oftentimes wild things that happen there. Well, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe it was a Waffle House here in the Carolinas that Kid Rock got arrested in because a little scuffle took place. You go into a Waffle House expecting this kind of stuff. <laughs> you do. It's part of it. It's, it's honestly like <laughs> the, the, the chaos is just as important as the scrambled eggs at a Waffle House. And I think that episode proved it. But, you know, I do want to say the the uh, the corporate entity of Waffle House, they do a lot of really great stuff, especially, you know, big part of that episode was talking about how they're always the first places to open after a natural <laughs> after a natural yep. disaster yep. and taking care of the community. And that was really cool, too, because we have the funny stories about, you know, the drunk guy that came in and cooked his own eggs because no one else was working. But we also talk about, you know, some of the great things they do. And we don't get that sentimental on, on our show or, you know, sometimes we do, but it, it actually surprised me. And I was like, you know, this, this, they, they do pretty cool things in the communities where they're based. They really do. Somewhere along the line though, you, you've got to get with Guy and Sammy Hagar and go, go have a midnight dinner at the Waffle House. Because I mean, I mean, I just would love to see that conversation or hear it on your podcast. <laughs> yeah. We've talked to those guys. A couple times, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of Guy Fieri and, uh, you know, Sammy Hagar, too, obviously. And I have to say, you know, we do talk to um, some some famous people from time to time. And those guys are just so down to earth, so fun. <laughs> and they're they're best friends too, like themselves. And that just totally shows. I mean, you cannot meet two nicer guys yeah. than than those two. Speaking of nice people, um, I, li I like the way that you, whoever is working with you, creating your, your podcast and stuff like that with you, you allow people like Atlas and Joshua to come on to talk about their app. Because, I mean, I mean, I mean, it, it, that's, people don't do that kind of stuff, but you say, yeah, I do. We're, we're going to talk about their app in New Jersey. Yeah, that's interesting you brought that up, Arrow, because, you know, like in, in some ways, Atlas Obscura is a competitor of Thrillist, right. right? They kind of do something similar. And when I pitched that idea to um, my bosses, really, it was kind of like, hey, I know that we're like kind of advertising a competitor here. However, they do great things and we do great things. Let's have them on and talk about where we overlap and what their vision of travel in the future is. And I think that's just like so important, you know, it's not a competition between us. It's it's about like working together and figure out how we can make this industry a little bit better and how we can like uh, make people excited about traveling again. So I was all for it. I'm, I'm big fans of Atlas and they're big fans of us. So uh little crossover episode there, right? You know, you know, in sitcoms, they used to do that, right? Well, that's what I've always loved about podcasters in, in general. It's not like the egos of radio people where, you know, you, you've got to use that guerrilla warfare and stuff like that in order to beat them in the ratings. But uh, podcasters tend to cross pollinate very, very nicely. Yeah. And you kind of have to. It's a great way to promote uh, what we do and promote what they do. And um, you don't seem like you have that big of an ego, Arrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You seem good. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's because yeah. I want everybody to win. You know, that, that's one of the things okay. that I, I was that jock that was on the air that wouldn't do radio contests. And I really struggled to, because I, I didn't want to give away a thousand dollars. And they would go, why? Why? And I go, because I have one winner and 99,000 losers. I don't want to do that to 99,000 people. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I, now you just said that. Maybe we should do some type of contest. I don't know. That sounds interesting. <laughs> now I'm thinking like that might be a good idea for us. Now let's let's break it down. Now you 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 have you say that Austin has got a pretty good breakfast taco. Now come on now. What what would make their tacos better than what we have here in Carolina? Um. Well, I think that's a very so you know that kind of question. It's the same thing as why are the bagels right. quote unquote better, better in New, New York? York why? Yeah. <laughs> Why is this sushi better in L.A.? And I think it's a lot of things. You know, I I think it is it mainly stems from the tradition of making them there. You know, let's let's take Austin breakfast tacos or let's even take Brooklyn bagels, because that's where I'm from. And I know that I know that a little bit more. It's like people know how to make it. They're trained how to make it by people who are trained that go back generations and generations. They just know how to do it. It's not some secret ingredient. It's not some like weird wild method it's just it's a lot of practice and it's learning from people who have learned from people who have been doing this for years it is really just the tradition you know it's going to be hard for unless somebody moves from austin who has been making breakfast tacos for 50 years to charlotte and opens up a place Mm -hmm. it's going to be hard to get that type of quality and tradition um in a different city and that and that's really just that's what it is you'll see it happen sometimes but uh on the whole it's just like you can go so like two dozen places in Austin and probably get the best breakfast taco of your life. But that's just the culture there. You're, you're so right about that when it comes to different restaurants and stuff like that. It's just, I mean, In-N-Out burgers are totally L.A., California. But I really don't think it would work in Carolina because, I mean, I think Chick-fil-A just dominates this area. Right. Exactly. And even using the fast food analog, I mean, you're, you're right. It's taste and it's just like... Um, it's how they run their business too. Yeah, yeah. Man, do you ever feel like a rock star when you go into these cities and wonder what city am I in today? I, I totally don't know because I've been everywhere. Um, I I do and I don't. I mean, like you know, I, you might have this too, but a lot of times when I'm in a city, I'm a little bit stressed because I'm there for work, you know. <laughs> and uh, maybe we do a lot of coverage of bars, and sometimes I'll have a drink, and then I'll feel a little bit less stressed, and maybe that is when that feeling kicks in, you know. But um. Yeah, it, it is sometimes. Sometimes we will do something where we go to a city back to back and we'll only spend like one night there and we'll just record the entire time. And it, it definitely starts to blur together. It becomes kind of a whirlwind, but um, it is always fun. I always leave thinking, you know, that was a blast. And uh, as long as that continues, I think like, our show will be in good shape. So, what what kind of discipline do you go through? Because I was I was I did a lecture on on Monday, and I that was one of the th- main things that I, I really put into these these students that are growing toward podcasting is that you have got to have a daily discipline of how many hours that you can put into it. Otherwise, you're going to be in that studio for 18 hours, and then you're going to get burnout. Definitely, um, you know, it's b- being in the studio is one thing. Being out field recording, I think, like the, the best advice, and it's it's hard to do. It's just like always be recording and that's where the best discipline comes in like Mm -hmm. you just always have to be recording record everything wherever you go little because i you know you listen to the show obviously arrow and you know that we include a lot of um kind of like not so much behind the scenes but kind of verity stuff you know people talking about random stuff people like putting on their microphones and small talking and uh, honestly like that is some of the best stuff that we capture it because people's guards are down and they're uh, a little bit more natural. So, I mean, you just have to always, even though it's uncomfortable and even though it's hard and it's a lot of effort, just always be recording, try to capture everything because um, then you can go through it all later and get what you want. You can't go back. You know, you can't go back <laughs> to the city that you were in. I mean, you can, but it's not, you know, my company's not going to pay for that. So, <laughs> Oh, you're so right <laughs> you about that. you got to always be recording. You're so right about that, about recording devices and stuff like that, because I've got Zooms with me at all time. And and I've also got, I mean, I'm just everything. I, I can, if somebody were to walk in front of me right now, it, the goal is is to get that conversation. And and it's and, and, and it's, just, it's, it's just who we are as podcasters. And, and I don't even want to, because that, that cheapens what we do. It's who we are as storytellers, that we just want to capture the moment. Definitely, definitely. And that, that's so important. It's also making the people that you're talking to feel comfortable and, um, you know, trying to get their story out, really, yeah. because that's what that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to tell their story and put it into um, into this great medium. So so how many meetings did you have to go through to get the story out about hotels being the best place for sex? Uh, <laughs> I, that was a pretty quick sell um, to my bosses, and uh, really, we found. Oh, yeah, it was because when you raise that question, a lot of people are like, 
you get two reactions. You're either like, I don't think that's true. Or a lot of people are like, oh my God, yeah, I never really even thought about that, but you're totally right. So we found a sex therapist pretty soon that was like definitely willing and able to talk about that, kind of going through the machinations and the uh, <laughs> the psychology of it. And I mean, if you listen to the episode, it, it kind of boils down to um, you're not in your house. You're not worried about the... Uh, the cobweb in yeah. the corner of <laughs> your ceiling. You're not worried about, you're not like looking over and seeing your work computer. You're in an entirely different place. You're usually on vacation. Um, and that just lets you relax a little bit more unless your inhibitions down. Yeah, and most of those hotels nowadays, when you step into the bigger ones, they've got garden tubs and all that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, it totally sets you up for your own little personal porn. It does. And, you know, a lot of uh, boutique and luxury hotels, they'll even have like little packages on the mini bar. I don't know if you've seen this where they have like lube and condoms yep, and yep. sometimes even vibrators. So, I mean, they're they're setting they, they know what business they're in. Right. And they're they're just setting people up for that. One of, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was with the different regions of food and stuff like that. My wife is from Chicago and she's always talking about mm. the beef and stuff like that, the, the the Italian beef. And and then when I get with people from Chicago, they have no idea what she's talking about. But yeah, you, so did you run through the same thing when it came to finding the best cheesesteak in Philly? Because, I mean, if I go to Philly, I got to have the cheesesteak, but I would hate to go up there and people go, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Well, you know, the interesting thing about cheesesteaks is, um, You can almost go, you can definitely go anywhere in America and really almost anywhere in the world. And if you go to like a pizza shop, a kebab shop, places like that, a lot of them have cheesesteaks. So it is kind of this ubiquitous thing. But in Philly, it is just so different. I mean, this is religion to people there. They will fight you. They will scream (laughs) in your face about their favorite cheesesteak spot. Um, And, you know, you you mentioned, you know, the, the best and things like that. And also in that episode, we wanted to kind of, Think about what we as thrillists who does a lot of that stuff you know we talk about what is the best chicago dog in chicago what's yeah. the best pizza in new york what, what does best even mean when it comes to food because it's such a subjective arbitrary thing so all that was kind of folded in um and the takeaway is you know kind of going back even to the breakfast taco and off the thing cheesesteaks really are better in philadelphia it's hard to explain it's wild but it's just like they are so good there. There's there's so much love and and tradition put into those sandwiches. In in a very victorious way, don't you think that what you do on your podcast is that you you use the new texture in order to help paint the picture. In other words, you know the the perfectionist listeners don't want the perfect studio. They 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 want to actually feel what it is that you're going through. Yeah. Yes. And that that's really important to me. Actually, like you know, our our we try to own our mistakes, right? I think that. One at one part in that cheesesteak episode, I was taste testing something, holding a microphone, and I dropped it. Yeah. Uh, or it turned off. It turned off because I was so into it. And we just kind of owned that. We were like, hey, there's a big gap here because I was so excited I turned my mic off. But here we're, we're coming back in. And that to me, you know, that's what I like to see when I'm uh, watching documentaries, when I'm listening to stuff like this. It's like nobody's perfect and sometimes a really polished product even kind of turns me off because it's not, it doesn't seem real. It seems artificial. So we definitely try to go for that. Do you ever have one of those challenges with your, with the people that you work with where it's like, okay, we're going to fly out to Denver because Denver has such and such. And maybe you say, no, I'd rather get a better story in Ranchester, Wyoming. Do you, do you ever have little conversations like that? Yes, we do actually have conversations like that, but we're all pretty much on the same page because uh, at, at Thrillist, we do like to highlight, um, you know, we cover the Austins and the Chicago's and, the San Francisco's, uh, of course, but we definitely like to highlight cities that are underserved and surprising because that's that's really what we do. We try to uncover hidden gems in you know places uh, around you, but also entire cities that are underrated. That's always been a really big part of our business. So we're very aligned with that. Like just even bringing it back to Oklahoma City, that was immediately something everyone agreed upon. You know, it's not the sexiest uh, proposition. But it is something where it's like, wow, that is surprising and people should know about it. And that's kind of what people look to us for, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's like the Jonas Brothers have a family restaurant in Belmont, North Carolina, which is the next city over. And and they, now they've just announced they're going to re- uh, open that restaurant in Las Vegas. And it's like, oh, my God, Southern food <laughs> out there. Is it going to go over? <laughs> I don't know. I think it might. You know, I, I my, my parents are in Wilmington, North Carolina. I don't oh, know if you have a lot of experience. Down absolutely. There. I do. 
Yeah, they just moved last year. God, that, yeah, it's a gorgeous city, dude. It really is. To me, that was the Hollywood of the of the East Coast because that's where all the studios were, and then before they all moved down to the Atlanta area. But yeah, that's oh, that's a gorgeous town, man. Great food there too. You know, that's why I was thinking about it. It's great southern food. That's where I ate shark for the very first time. It was in Wilmington. Oh, really? Do you, do you remember the name of the restaurant? Uh, it, it, you know, it was it was over there by the battleship. It, yeah, and so it was like before we were going to go on for the tour and stuff like that. But it was it was it was in that area, and it was like and they and they let you eat right there on the water. I'm going, damn! This is got this is the experience <laughs> right here. Eating shark on the water. <laughs> Amazing! I love that. I'm going to search for that the next time I go down there to visit them. Yeah, and they, they've got the craziest looking bridges and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, even with your podcast and stuff like that, you have this way of making those bridges come to life in our imagination without having to race to Google to see what it really looks like. Right. And that's, I mean, painting, you know, you, you kind of nailed it, like painting the picture and using audio, and using textures and using uh, ambient sounds. And our editors do such a good job of blending this all together. You know, I can put everything in a script, but they're the people that really bring it to life and um, put music in there. They do a great job with that. And it's just, again, that's really the reason I love podcasting so much. It really brings these stories to life in a way that you can't do with an article. Dude, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. I love talking with you. This is so fun. You're you're very, uh, I, I thank you so much for all the kind words. I really, really appreciate it. Will you be brilliant today, okay? Yeah, you too, Ariel. Thank you so much.